All right. Uh, good morning, church family. Good morning. Thank you. Happy Sabbath to you too. All right. Uh, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have osteoarthritis and you're under medication today. But I'm sure most of you have heard about this degenerative disease, mostly in the knee joints. And many of you may have even had a surgery or something like that to relieve some of that pain that you had. Okay? Now, you're not alone. And those of you who are young, you will hear about it at some point in your life. There are about 15% of our population around the world that suffer from this disease. And mostly it's treated by pain medications, anti-inflammatories. And it's treated by heat therapy and exercises and things like that. And then there are some people who progress further and will need surgery of the knee joint in the knee. And it's called an arthroscopic surgery. And this is where a physician will insert a pencil-sized tube into your knee, and then they'll remove all the stuff inside and try to smooth out things so that you'll have a pain-free life. So just pretend that there is a person that is ready for the surgery because of this degenerative disease. And so let's say the surgery is already scheduled, and the previous day, a nurse or someone will call from the hospital, and they'll go through some procedures, what we call as pre-op procedures. And then you go the next day, and then you go through some more procedures, and then they'll put on a hospital gown, and then they'll go through the anesthetic procedure and clean up the area, and then finally they'll get you into the operating room and then they'll go through the surgery, All right? There will be, when you come out of the surgery, again, you'll go through this process of post-operative surgery, and then hopefully in a couple of days, you'll start feeling better, the swelling is down, and you're ready to go on with your life. And so you go back to your doctor's office, and you say, Doc, that was a very good surgery. I, I feel a whole lot better. And uh, when will this incision heal? And this is pretty much what happens on a routine basis, right? About a million of these surgeries are done every year. Except in this particular incident, you did not have surgery. It was a sham surgery. It was fake. All you saw was the motions that you went through were all fake, but it was real. You did not have anything inserted into your knee joint. You did not have anything removed from your knee joint. All you saw was two little scars on the side of your knee joint, but you felt better. 74% of people who go through the sham surgery feel better. It cost $5,000. So before you go to your doctor and ask him for a refund, <laughs> let's talk about it. How did it work? How did this surgery work when nothing was actually done inside your knee joint and it felt better? 75% of people felt better. And even after they were told that it was a sham surgery, they still felt better. Now, how did that happen? Right? So today we're going to talk about beliefs, and I'm here to say that beliefs have consequences. Beliefs have consequences. Right? So here's that knee surgery that is done to about a, thousand, a million people go through that. So we're trying to figure out how does this happen, and what are beliefs, and why is that important for us? Right? So let me give you an idea how this works. And this is how we all are created. And uh, so I'm trying to help you understand how beliefs can have consequences and how beliefs can actually remove the pain and the suffering that you've had. All right, so here's how uh, the human body works. 
And there is external evidence that is coming into our five senses. There is no other way it will come in. All external evidence has to come in through our five senses. So that is what? Sight, smells, taste, right? hearing, and then touch. Now this is this we call the external evidence. As they come into the human body, we have to make decisions out of that. There is no other way to do it. This is how we are created, right? So we have to make decisions about what, what we're going to do with this evidence that's coming in. Now, the interesting thing about this is, once you make a decision, you have to act on it. And all actions happen in the future, and therefore you have to make the right decision. So what do you do, right? So in other words, you have to do something that will tell you, all right, it's time to act. We don't act on everything that comes in, but we certainly act on certain things. So what makes you act on those things? There are so many things that happen in this decision process, but today we are here to talk about beliefs, right? So here it is, just to recap, this external evidence coming in. You have to take that evidence and make decisions out of it, and then you have to act. And one of the things that help you make those decisions are beliefs. All right, so this is crucial for us. And without beliefs, this is how we are created. Without beliefs, it's hard to act, it's hard to do things. And I'm not talking about a set of religious beliefs or political beliefs. I'm talking about all beliefs. The fact that you got up this morning and you say, I believe that I'm going to meet my creator, my God, in my church, that's a belief. The fact that you got up and you said, if I wear these clothes, it will keep me warm, that's a belief. Every little thing that we do in our human life revolves around those beliefs that we have grown, that we have learned, and that we have learned from experience. So today we're going to talk about those beliefs and why it is so important and how those beliefs can have tremendous consequences in what we generally do. All right? So now, how do we understand these beliefs? There are two ways to do it. And the first one is to understand through scripture. And I think this is one of the best things to do. And so there are two options for us in the world. And the first one is God's word. Because if, you, if we believe that God created this world and he created us and he created our brains and he created everything that we do, then we need to understand what, what did God do. One, he spoke. And this we call God's word. And so within God's word, we have evidence that there are things that talk about these beliefs. All right, so that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is through God's creation or his works. And this is, this, this is fascinating as well. And that is we study God's works in different forms. And you can pick any profession and your profession, and you'll have something to learn about God's work. You can take psychology, you can take philosophy, you can take your engineering, you can take any profession that you have, your nursing and medicine and any other profession. You will find how God reveals himself through this, through his works, and that's what we basically study actually. And one fascinating that, that I like and that I'm interested in and that's what we're going to do a little bit today. And that is I do neuroscience. And in neuroscience, this is what we do. And I like the intersection between those two. All right? So I like to bring in the, what we can learn from Scripture, God's Word, and what we can learn from God's work and through sciences. All right? Now, it's the intersection that draws a lot of interest. And it's really, really fascinating. So how, what can we learn about God's word? Now I can understand, you know, we can never know what God really is. We can never know exactly and understand exactly how God is, but we sure can learn a lot more with this combination. All right, so how did the sham surgery work? Paid $5,000 and you felt better and they actually did nothing. This actually started back in 2002 in the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, 
And then ever since, people have been trying to do this sham surgeries, which seem to be working. Right? So it always starts with the person. Always. Starts with the person. In this instance of the sham surgery, the person is your physician. Now, over time, you have learned something about this physician. Somebody may have told you he's the best physician in the whole wide world, or you have to go to this hospital, and it's the best hospital there is. You're learning. You're learning. So there are two ways that you learn. One, you learn passively, and that is just information keeps coming into your mind, and then you learn from that in information. Passively, you learn from that. There's another way that you learn, and that is you learn by acting, by doing it. And so you actually go to this physician because you have arthritis and you hurt, and so you actually take an action. You go to the physician, you explain what your problem is, and hopefully they're trying, you and your physician are trying to find your problems you say, and find a solution for that. Right, so two ways of learning. One, you learn passively from others and your observations and all of that and reading web pages, whatever it is. Another one is actual interaction, where you actually act with this physician, right? And then out of that interaction comes an outcome and maybe you felt better. And over time you've learned to trust this or you learn to learn, to learn and, like, and like this physician. Now, it doesn't have to be a physician. It can be anybody. It's your pastor. It can be your neighbor. It can be your professor. It can be an engineer. Any one of you can go through this, right? We develop beliefs about people, about our friends, about our families, about our neighbors, and everybody else. But these things happen in an interaction, right? So you learn passively. You learn actively through actions, and over time, and over time, between those beliefs and the person, you develop, I mean, you develop beliefs about this person over and over and over again. Now, when this person, someone you believe in, someone with whom you've had interaction, says, now look, we're going to do a surgery on you, and it may hurt a little bit initially, but you're going to feel better later. And then you believe that and you say, yes. You expect those things to work. And that's exactly what happened with the arthroscopic surgery in your knee. 74%. And later on, they were told that actually nothing was done and they still felt better. Right? So we're trying to figure out what are these beliefs and then how do we form those beliefs? Now, the nice thing about beliefs is, uh, so what are beliefs, right? Now, beliefs are principles that guide action, that guide our lives. They're assumptions. Sometimes we hold them for a little while so we can test them and then form those beliefs. But whatever it is, we are learning about those principles and assumptions and expectations. And then over time, they become solid, they, be, they solidify, they gain roots into that, right? And it becomes baked in, as people say, right? So how does this happen? The interesting thing about this is this is no different what we find in the Bible and then what we learn in neuroscience. And the best example I can give you is the parable of the sower. And this is a parable that Jesus gave it's actually a very nice parable, right? So here's the parable. He said there was a farmer that went out to sow. And he sowed his seed, and some seed fell on the wayside. And some seed fell on the rocky side with a little, just a little bit of soil. And then some fell among the thorns, and some fell on the good ground. The, the fascinating thing about this is, this is exactly how beliefs are formed. So how does this work? In fact, Jesus gave the answer to the whole thing. He said that the seed that fell on the wayside did not, could not hold on. The birds of the air came in and picked up the seed, and it was gone. And that's exactly how beliefs are if you don't set roots into that. 
So what happens? Jesus said, well, the devil comes and takes it away. So if you don't understand something, and if you don't, if in some ways it's more passively learned, then eventually it gets taken away. Now, what about the ones that fell on the stony places? Well, they, f they, 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 they did sprout, but it withered away because the roots could not go in. And so therefore, there are beliefs that way where it does not take hold because another belief comes in and this belief is gone. Right? And so the, the, this, is, uh, this is how it generally happens with beliefs as well. And over time, this is why you have to test it and test it and see how it works and then form those beliefs. Right? So this, are, this is the stony places. And another thing, the, the reason that Jesus said it withered away is because when tribulations and persecutions come, then it tests you, and because there's not enough root to hold, those beliefs go away. What about the ones that fell in between the thorns? They sprouted, but unfortunately, they got choked because of the thorns. And Jesus said it's because of the cares of the world. The cares of the world and the beliefs about riches of the world chokes you. But these new beliefs form, and these beliefs that you're trying to, that's trying to take hold is gone. Now remember, one, two, and three, which is the wayside, the stony places, and the, among the thorns, none of them had an action. None of them yielded fruit. Because the beliefs came and stayed for a while, it was gone. The last one is into the good ground, and this is where the roots take in. You understand something. But the nice and fascinating thing about that is you act. And out of the actions come those fruits. And those fruits are what? 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30-fold. To God, that doesn't matter whether it's 100, 30, 60. It's still the same. Same thing with the guy with the talents. The blessings were exactly the same whether it was five talents or ten talents. So it's, but you have to act. And this is the act, active way of developing beliefs. You can't get, if you learn beliefs passively, they don't hold for too long, and then eventually they're gone. Or someone can manipulate those passive beliefs and then make it their own. And before you know it, you got hijacked on that. And this is why you have to act, and active goals are what Jesus is talking about when he said the seed fell in the good place, right? So let's put this into Christianity because we're now talking about Jesus. Let's talk about beliefs and how Jesus expects us to form those beliefs. So here's Jesus, always starts with a person. No matter what the beliefs are, it's always about a person because it is this person that drives everything else from then on, right? And it can be anybody. In this case, Christianity, we're talking about Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ has made promises. He has made, he has made a lot of, uh, I mean, he has given us a lot of lessons, and he has given us a lot of information. So we look at Jesus Christ, and it, this can also come passively, or it can come actively. When, it, when I say passively, it could be something that you're sitting there and listening to a sermon. This is more passive, right? Or it can be you're just reading something, and I know it, you're actively reading it, but it's still passively getting into your, into your mind. Right? So again, what about the other side? You can listen to what Jesus said, and then you can act on it. And that's what I'm interested in today. And that is those actions that you take will yield some outcomes, and in many ways, you're actually testing what the good Lord said. He said, if you do this, this will happen. Right? It's a promise. So what happens to those actions? You form beliefs. Beliefs about what? Beliefs about Jesus. These are beliefs about Jesus, because this is what ultimately drives those actions, but we, so we need that. Right? And so eventually, in your experience with Jesus Christ, in this walk with Jesus Christ, you soon start forming those beliefs, and those beliefs take deep hold in your life. 
And those beliefs are the ones that should drive those actions. But there's a caveat to that. There's a caveat to that. All right? So let me get to the caveat in just a minute. But first, let's talk just a little bit. So there are two kinds of beliefs, that, two ways that we form beliefs. And the longer you test those beliefs and the longer you act on those beliefs, the beliefs take strong hold and they become stronger and don't get choked with the other beliefs that we have. Right? So this is how Christianity is. It's about Jesus and a promise or the promises that he said in his teachings. We act on those teachings and we form those beliefs. And before we know, there's an association between Jesus Christ and those beliefs. This is true with not just only Jesus Christ, but with any other person. So it's all about the person. So whenever I say beliefs in what, you should always say in whom. Right? It's always about somebody. It's your neighbor, your family, or anything. It can be about a product. It can be about a company. It can be about a church. Right? So this is the fundamental basis of beliefs. And then, so let's talk about it a little bit more. So here's a dilemma now. The dilemma is, when you read the Bible, there are verses that say you, shall, you need to believe and you will have eternal life, right? So here it is. So this is, this is the association. And that is, okay, you have formed beliefs to be saved or to have eternal life, you must first believe. Now there's so many texts in the Bible I don't want to go through, but the most prominent one is John 3.16 where Jesus says that if you believe, you shall have eternal life, right? If you read a little further, it says if you don't believe, then you will be condemned, right? So on one side, if you believe, you're going to be saved. On the other side, if you don't believe, you're not going to be saved. Now, if you continue to read in other books of the Bible, here's the dilemma, and that is, it is through faith you're going to be saved. So on one side, it says you have to believe to be saved. On the other side, it says you have to have faith to be saved. Which is it? Which is it? Right? And so this is the dilemma, and let's explore this a little further. Now, you may say maybe it means the same thing, but in neuroscience, they're not exactly the same. I know the Bible in Greek, it's pistos, which has the root word for belief and faith and all of that. But in neuroscience, it's entirely two different concepts. Right? So that might actually help explain the dilemma. Right? A little further, faith without works is dead. So in other words, you have, you'll be saved. You believe you're going to be saved. Then there are other verses that say you'll be saved through faith. Then there are other verses that say faith without works is dead. Now, the, I've even mathematically written this formula for you. Faith minus works equals dead, right? It's exactly the same thing, right? Faith minus works is equal, is, equal, is equal to dead. Now, the question is, is there a resolution to this? The answer is yes, the Bible provides that, and then we have some good evidence coming in from neuroscience as well, right? So again, back to this, it's all about Jesus Christ, right? It's all about the person. It's all about the person. And therefore, your salvation hinges on what you believe about this person called Jesus Christ. Now, let's hope you actively, actively participated in this relationship with Jesus Christ. You believe in the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made for you and me, right? And we believe that if we hold on to that, then Jesus, God will judge Jesus Christ instead of me. That's the belief. And that's what we believe, right, as a church too. So here's Jesus Christ. You take some actions based on what Jesus said. You hold on to the promise that Jesus said, and soon you form beliefs. But then you say you're saved through faith, and here's the missing link. This is where faith comes into play. So what is faith? We did a, I did a presentation last year on faith. Let me just recap just a little bit about what this is. Beliefs by itself don't cause, cause actions. It's all about the person. And the question is, do you believe, do you have faith in that person? 
So whenever you use the word faith, you always ask yourself, faith in whom? Because Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins, the question is, do you have faith in him that he will carry us through? And this is why you need the, this faith. And without faith, there is no action. There is no action. Pur purposeful action. Right? So it's, it's the willingness to act. Faith drives that willingness to act. Right? So let me differentiate this too so that you have some idea what that is. And whenever you say the word belief, it's belief about somebody. And in this case, about Jesus Christ. But faith is in that person. In this case, it's faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, are you willing to act because you have faith in Jesus Christ? Are you willing to walk your life that you would be saved because of his sacrifice because you have this faith in Jesus Christ? So in other words, from Jesus Christ's perspective, he made it possible for us to have faith because he proved to be trustworthy. To be trustworthy. Right? And so this is generally how it works. So what's the connection between beliefs and faith? And this is how it works. If you continue in this relationship over and over and over with Jesus Christ, eventually those beliefs start acting directly in faith. And we're looking at a path that is beliefs to faith and faith to action you need all these three and they act in tandem right it's belief about jesus christ but it's your faith in jesus christ that will lead to those good works and this is why the bible says faith without works is dead the interesting thing about this is, this is when you have this pathway, it's easy to get hijacked by someone who comes in and he says, have faith in me. And then eventually when you have faith in that person, the beliefs will slowly shift to whatever that person says it is. This is really an interesting phenomenon. We see this in business, we see this in politics, we see it in pretty much in every walk of life where, again, if we lose focus on in whom we are having our faith, then actions become natural and automatic. Right? So it's the person. It's always, and I hope I stress this enough, it is beliefs about Jesus Christ, but it is your faith in Jesus Christ that will cause those actions, those actions. Right? So... So what's the difference? Let's take this a little further. And that is, what about us human beings? Do we have access to those beliefs? Or do we just judge people on their actions? Right? So last week I asked you all the question. And I said, would you believe someone? Or would you trust someone who says, we, I believe we should help somebody? Or would you trust someone who actually does something? And most of us agreed last week that we tend to trust someone who acts. Nothing wrong about that. Nothing wrong about that. But the interesting thing is, but Jesus, but God does not do that. He judges beliefs. He has access to that. We don't. We have access to other people's actions, and we act based on the actions. We reciprocate to those actions. And this is the reason why when Jesus said uh, to Samuel, when God said to Samuel, remember when Saul was not doing a good job as a king? And God said, okay, it's time to get the next guy. So he sent him to Bethlehem and he said, all right, there's a guy, there's a family there. I want you to look at all his kids. So Samuel thought, let me do the right thing. Let's call in the first son, Eliab. And he looked at Eliab, and he was tall, and he was handsome, and he said, oh, this guy looks like a king, the next king. But God said, no, no, no. This is now, this, God doesn't see the way man sees. He says, men look at the outward appearance, but God 
look at in the heart. So today I'm going to solve that. What is the heart? Heart is the same as beliefs. It's the same as beliefs, right? So two lessons to learn from here. This is why Jesus said, judge not. Because we don't have access to people's beliefs. We only have access to people's actions, to actions. Is it possible that you can have same actions but two different beliefs? Is it possible? Same action, two different beliefs. The answer is yes, and I think most of you agree on that. I'll give you an example of this. Um, my, many of our students in the university like to do community service because it helps them get better jobs. It helps them look good. Their resumes look good, right? And so many of them actually go to orphanages and go to places and uh, to, to places that you and I would not normally go, and they actually do some good community work. I'm not complaining about that, but many times I've asked them, what is it that you're trying to accomplish from this community work? And most of the time, the answer is what? Their beliefs about what this would do. The belief is what? If I put a lot of community work in my resume, I'll get a better job, or I'll get better admissions, or something like that. That's the belief. But that's not how God wants us to do. I mean, I do appreciate the community work that they do. But it's also, it's what's the direction? Do you believe in the person of Jesus Christ? And he said to do that, and therefore, this is why I'm going to do. Again, two different beliefs, same action. And this is why God has better access to our beliefs than we as human beings. Okay? So... Again, beliefs, whenever God, Jesus says, I judge the heart, every time you read the Bible that says heart, you can fairly substitute that with beliefs. Because beliefs are emotionally driven, as, especially when beliefs are very strongly held. They're emotionally driven, and every time we say God judges the heart, he judges those beliefs because he has access to those beliefs that you and I do not have. Again, Beliefs have consequences. Beliefs have consequences. All right, so what about grace? What about beliefs? What about faith? And what about action? Now, this is fascinating. Remember, beliefs are based on about the person. Faith is about, about your willingness to act because of the promise that this person said, right? And therefore, we act because we trust or we have faith in this person. In Christianity, is Jesus Christ. But the fascinating thing about this is, Jesus Christ said, whatever I, this promise I give you is free. It's free. Right? The, the natural way is we believe, we trust, and then we act. But here, Jesus took away that pressure of acting, and he gave, gave it as a free gift. And he said, don't worry about those actions. I'm more interested in this. Here's a free gift. I did it all for you. The question is, do you believe that? And do you have faith in that promise that I will see you through? He has made himself trustworthy so that we can have faith and trust in him. Right? So this is how grace comes into play. And that is, so I don't want you to walk away saying that he talked about actions because, you know, because of faith. But I want, I want to make sure that we understand the fundamentals of Christianity, and it's all in this one verse, right? It is through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. Do you hold on to that? Is that your belief? And do you have faith in Jesus Christ that he'll see you through and that you will be saved. And this is, this is fundamental. And then after that, actions are automatic. When your life is grounded in Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, in his promises, you will trust him, and then actions become automatic. Now, if you don't believe that, I want you to read this, right? So this is Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, right? Through faith, 
and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. In other words, we are his creation, right? Here's the automatic part. The automatic part is when you are grounded or created in Jesus Christ, then good works will follow. Good works will follow. This is the intent. This is the intent. And this is why Jesus Christ had come into this world, so that we could learn about him and have some faith in him. And then good works will follow. Right? So the next thing and the last thing is, well, if you believe, what do you do? Now, this is believe in who now, right? In whom? And having faith in whom? And if it is Jesus Christ, then you will act. You will act even no matter what you believe because you need those beliefs to act. The question is, are those those good works that, that God is talking about? If those are driven by those beliefs, those are driven and grounded in, in faith, and then therefore those good works follow. Right? So if you believe, and if you believe in the promise of Jesus Christ, you will act. You will act. The next thing is, as I, can, I mean, these are common things that we've always talked about. And that is, Jesus said, if you follow in my footsteps. In other words, you are acting because you believe and because you have faith that the same direction that those footsteps are going leads you to eternal life. Right? And so follow in his footsteps. There are, there are other reasons why we believe. Don't you want others to join you in this? Before Jesus Christ left this world, he said, he gave us a commission, actually. And the commission is to go around the world and teach and preach and baptize so that others can follow the same footsteps that Jesus Christ has walked in. All right, so it's a commission to us. It, he didn't say, just learn about me. He said, go do it. So there's action that comes with it. There's action that comes with it. And this is a hard one these days, especially in our country, and that is hard to love our neighbors. And this is something that Jesus Christ tried to point it out, and he, and he did it himself so that we could learn something out of this. And this is what? Faith in action. And the easiest thing to do to prove that you believe about him, that you have faith in him, and therefore you're going to act on what he has promised, to love your neighbor as yourself. And this is the real challenge for Christians today. And that is where we are judged by our actions and not on based on what we believe because, you know, it somehow beliefs and actions don't match in our Christian walk. It's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for you, right? And the last thing is strengthen those beliefs. Those beliefs don't simply happen. They happen in the experience with Jesus Christ in our walk with Jesus Christ. Because remember that, that loop and that feedback is so important. It's all about the person of Jesus Christ. And the more you follow him and the more you believe, the more you have faith in him, those beliefs get strengthened and over and over. And that's what will yield those actions of a hundredfold, of sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. It's not what I'm trying to say so far is that beliefs have consequences. Thank you so much.